Hello and welcome to another episode of Evolve by Erica, the podcast. I am your host, Erica Polsonelli, and we are here to talk about all things high vibrational, this path of a spiritual awakening and ascension. So I'm so glad that you're here today. Come on in. Welcome. Today, I have something really exciting planned for you guys. I have my best friend, my soulmate, my twin flame, and my husband, Vincent Polsonelli, joining me today for <laughs> for this episode and possibly the next two episodes, depending on how today goes. So you guys know I don't, I can't really plan things. Things just flow when we're in this space. We have a and lot to talk about. So Yeah. Do you want to tell them some things that we have to talk about? I mean, um, I believe we're going to be speaking about how we met, um, you know, our, you know, first couple of years together dating, um, my whirlwind of uh, addiction and then recovery, and then followed by, you know, starting a life together, um, moving to Long Beach and, um, you know, you and your jobs, multiple jobs. And how we kind of both ended up here together. Yeah. I think that's a great plan. We'll get right into it. Let's roll with it. Where do you want to start us? Do you want to start us out today? Sure. Yeah. Um, I would say it was like 2008. 2008, somewhere around there, sophomore in college at Hofstra. Uh, Hofstra University on Long Island. And um, yeah, we met at the Dizzy Lizard Saloon. I, I remember guys... it to be Nacho Mama's. Oh my god, that's just. <laughs> we uh, always have a different is, story of how we met. He thinks just, we met at Dizzy Lizard. I think we false. met at Nacho Mama's. These are bars at Hofstra. Okay, tell me, tell us your memory. I just remember being in the there. corner over there, in the back corner, in the outside part, and I just remember meeting you and um, your best friend Jamie. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. That's that's just how I remember it. I remember something with camouflage. Maybe I was wearing some sick camo pants maybe at the time because yeah. they were in and some dunks. I, I remember that. <laughs> she remembers it apparently different. But. I want to tell my version. So I, and this is unusual because you, Vinny knows, like I don't have the best memory. And this is a little side note. Supposedly when you open up spiritually, you lose some of your memory because you're going into 5D. So that's my excuse oh my for not God. having a great memory. Oh my, I'll let this slide. So I remember being at Nacho Mama's and all of a sudden this man walked in, this boy, this guy, whatever you want to call it. And he was in a ridiculous outfit, but like I didn't even process his physical appearance. It was just like his energy. Like I literally felt his energy. And mind you, at the time I was definitely drunk. I was not quote unquote spiritual, but I just felt something as soon as he walked in the door. I think they call it frat boy energy. (laughs) I think that's what they call it. It was just like, bam, like it was, that's what no, it was. I honestly, what it is, it's his heart of gold. And if you know Vinny, if you've met Vinny, you know that everyone just wants to be around him because he makes you laugh. He makes you feel good. He's the best hype person. And that's what I believe I sensed as soon as I saw you. Could be. So he walked in. I was like, oh my gosh, like everything got slow. It sounds so cliche and corny, but that was it. I looked at him and I'm like, I'm going after that guy. And then do you remember what you told me all night? No. (laughs) Come on. I don't. don't. He's like, girl, you got me hooked. You got me hooked. And that's what he said. I may have said something along those those lines. (laughs) May have had a few drinks, but. Honestly, from then on, yeah, there was kind of like, um, you know, we may have not dated all the way through till. Let's call it what it is. This guy ghosted me. <laughs> he ghosted me. Okay, we hung out. We were we into out. it. And he eventually ghosted me. <laughs> and I was like, damn, guess my uh, intuition led me the wrong way. Jeez. So what were you saying? <laughs> Something like that. So uh, I don't know. Maybe there's a falling out. I'm not sure. It was, it was some sort of ghosting. Um, but actually, I did know right right away after um, after we did stop speaking um, that you know she was definitely always in the back of my mind, always thinking about her, um, constantly always asking her best friends who were also you know we were kind of in the same circle, um, always asking. Uh, 
you know, how's she doing? What what is she up to? Blah, blah, blah. And people are always saying, like, dude, you lost your shot. You lost and your he shot. would actually say, like, how's my wife? And I would my literally friend say, would be like, she's not your wife. You yeah. literally ghosted her. What are you talking about? Yeah. And I, I lived with her best friend because she was dating my best friend. Um, and we wound up getting together at the same time. Uh, so, like, every day I was with her best friend. And I was like, so, like, how's, how's my wife? How's my wife? She's like, dude, you, you blew it. Like, that's it. And I'm like, no, like one day, one day, one day. And, and it's crazy to think back, but like, those are all true statements. Yeah. And it's crazy. Look where we are today. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. And I would always think about him. Like I had other relationships, but I would always just like, I just knew in my body. I'm like, I just love that guy. And if I'm thinking about him, I know he's thinking about me too. And one day... We came back together really quickly. It was like a whirlwind and we just started dating again very, very, very quickly and everything just happened fast. Um, and we had a ton of fun together. Like we were the couple that would go out to dinner and like with appetizers order Patron shots. Yeah, I would Literally. say that. I mean, I thought it was standard at the time. <laughs> Not just standard. Just ripping shots before dinner. <laughs> yeah. That like at us. the house and then just yeah. like drink in the car, then like at dinner and then barely even eat and then go right into the club, you know, like that yeah. was. Yeah. I mean, Granted, like, we were in our 20s. We were young and crazy. Definitely crazy. Definitely, definitely crazy. young. Um, I mean, I, it was like kind of scary going out with her often into New York City because she kind of like knew a lot of people and she was like going into these clubs and I, I kind of went to like different types of clubs. And like I just I remember, went to the cool clubs. He went to like the creepy clubs. All right. I mean, <laughs> let's call it. She was going into Tanjun and she was going into all these awesome clubs. It just I was going into other clubs. And I just remember like watching her do her thing in that in in Tanjun one night. Or maybe it was another What's club. That's my thing. Your thing was just yeah. like running wild. <laughs> like I'll never forget one night going into this club and for whatever reason they had these two like giant maybe it was valentine's day they had these giant like teddy bear um mascots and they were standing on the speakers like dancing yeah. like dancers and i'll never forget she literally threw her bag at me and climbed up the speaker to get on top of the speaker to then rip this guy's giant teddy head off and the guy was like, what are you doing? And she sticks it on her head and she's dancing. And I'm like, oh my I God. I did not think this podcast was going to go this well, way. It, you it have went. like a ton of tricks in your pocket yeah, today. Yeah, I mean, listen. Oh God, I'm this, in trouble. These are <laughs> these are all facts. And I, I remember it vividly. Um, that, was, that was a great night. But uh, yeah, just, you know, being young and uh, partying. I'm sure yeah. like many of you, so. And we continued on until, you know, there comes a time where you're like, all right, we got to reel this back a little bit. And yeah. I was able to reel it back, but um, we started to notice that like maybe there was a problem here because Vinny wasn't really able to get a handle over it. Like we were, I mean, what, we moved. So we dated for a while. We moved in with each other in November of 2014. And then December of 2014, you proposed to me, literally a month from the day we moved in together. And during this time, like, it was very apparent that you start to have a problem. Yeah. Um, I would say that in college, it was tons of partying still went to school, still got my stuff down, graduated. And then eventually turned into like, I don't really want to just go to work every day. I want to still hang out with my friends. And that kind of just kept extending year after year. Like I'm going to work every day, but after work, like I want to go out and hang out with my friends. Um, so that was fine. But I just, I found myself getting into the same routine of uh, extracurriculars that, um, you know, weren't healthy uh, and, to call it to call it a spade a spade, I was I was doing a, a lot of painkillers. Um, that was my downfall, and a lot of the people I was in that were in my circle were doing the same thing. So it was kind of you know just plenty of partying. What just what you guys did? Come yeah, on. it's just kind of what yeah. we did. You know, like uh, that year 
that's what when that was what was cool at the time and that's what we kind of did and it kind of just progressed and progressed into um me definitely needing to get help and yeah. seek help yeah um so i remember the first time i went and, and asked for help was did you ask for help or did i like scream and cry for you to go get help i think it was a bit of both maybe yeah. my parents were like you know, the first one you went out to the Hamptons? Yeah. First one was uh, a program in the Hamptons, LICR. Mm. Um, it was a bit of pleasing her, appeasing my parents, kind of me knowing that it was getting out of hand. So I wanted to get a hold of it um, and put the kibosh on it. And it did work for some time. Um, it was a 30-day program, went in, did that, came out. Um, but I wasn't ready to like really stop. Yeah, it was like a, a good reset and uh, reevaluate my <clears throat> my my life, and it worked for a while, probably you know maybe half a year, uh, and then I kind of slowly got back into um, the partying and and just being crazy, um, all while working every yeah. single day six days and it was, a week like so stressful on our relationship because it was literally like the other person in our relationship like he would not want to hang out or be like oh i can't get there until seven and it'd be like nine o'clock and you would show up but we were always like living together late. yeah that's point. yeah that's why and then like i feel like we kind of decided like either we're going to move in together or this is never going to work like right. we have to figure this out and it's interesting because like when we first got into a relationship, I really didn't know that he was doing this. I was very naive. I've never done those drugs before. And I just thought like he was just crazy. But then when he started like falling asleep at dinner or doing like really suspect behaviors, I was like, there must be something more here. So he like was honest about it. It's like and a full time job. Said, yeah, honestly. it was a full time job. Like you were just like trying to stay afloat, trying to keep your relationship, keep up with your lies. Work. Keep up with like spending money on these terrible yeah, I mean, pills. I mean, yeah, and it was it was rampant at that point. It was everywhere. Um, so then we kind of I, after that first rehab stint, I kind of got my life back together. Um, and then we were, I think, we moved in together that before the second one. No, you went away one more time for like a week I around mean, like Easter one year. Not to me, not it's not funny, but um. That second time, I remember her and my father yes. both yes. saying, like, enough is enough. You need to go away. And and they were like, figure it out or we're going to send you somewhere. And I was like, no problem. I got this. And, like, I'm on the computer, like, top rehab facilities where you eat lobster and filet mignon. And I was yeah, like, this oh, this is perfect. And... This place in New Jersey popped up and it was like, I think it was like a 10 or 12 day like detox program. It was like, you check in, you go in there, you come off of everything. Um, you go to counseling classes, whatnot, and then you go home. And I was like, this is perfect. So I, I basically like a business plan, yeah. laid it all out. Proposed it to her, my father, my mother. I smelled bullshit right away. <laughs> she may have sniffed it out. <laughs> my dad's like, I don't care. Just go. Like, go do something. I'm like, awesome. So decided to go do that. Um, it was true. We definitely ate lobster and steak and it was awesome. Um, but it actually did nothing for my, uh, my issue at hand. And I feel like what you've learned, and you'll share more about this when we get there, but there's no easy way out to growth. And like you, you were trying to find the easy way there because you weren't ready. None. You there knew, was no easy way out. you knew the hard work that lied ahead for you, and you knew one day you were gonna do it, but it just wasn't that day. And there I was, just like, I know this isn't gonna work, but I love this man, and I will wait around because I see the light in him, and I know the potential he has, and I know what a great person he is. So he came home and right after he was right back to his regular stuff. So that's when I think shortly after that, we're like, let's try to move in together, see how things go. And serendipitously, we ended up in Long Beach. I actually really wanted to be in the city and Vinny really wanted to be like in the suburbs in a house. And I was like, no, 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 no. So I'm like, why we, don't we try Long Beach? We actually which almost was bought a house together yeah. in like my family's neighborhood 
like looking back at it, that would have been the worst decision ever. Yeah. Like stuck on like a tight block, like small house. And then she was like, let's just go check out Long Beach. I'm like, I'm, I mean, I've heard it. I've heard people like moving there. Um, and as soon as we got down here, we were like, wow, this is actually yeah. amazing. We like stumbled into um, just apartment buildings and we were literally like asking people like, do you have anything available? Do you have anything available? Like we put foot to pavement, literally, yeah. to go find us a place Boots on in the this ground, like, to find literally. A, a cool spot. And we found this amazing door woman, Joyce. She was like 80 years old. She like ran this building, a very young 80 year old. And she's like, I have a perfect spot for you. And it ended up being this little apartment. And there was actually a backyard because it was on the first floor of the building, which like was the only way I got Vinny into an apartment because he need he's a Virgo. He needs like earth and grass around him, as you guys know. My bonsai collection. So yes. Large. Yeah, he needed space for all his bonsai. So it was just like the perfect way to get us in together and get us into Long Beach. And it was just all very divine. But unfortunately, it didn't stop there. We had some crazy nights. I'll never forget the night of the tomato plants. No, I think it was a sunflower. Honestly. It was a sunflower. Do you I wanna, mean, do you want to share about that night? Well, I remember this was, a, I think it was like the last this night. This was like a breaking point. This was yeah. like one of the last nights before. Yeah. Um, we were, you know, at our pool. Our pool, community pool um, from our building is like right on the beach. And it was a lot of fun. Like all different ages, all partying at the pool every single day. And Long Beach is known to be like a rowdy town a little bit. Like you come here to like party. Some like, you know, wild older folk. And that day happened to be one of them. They were like, oh, let's have margaritas. No, it was frozen mojitos. Uh, frozen I'll never mojitos, forget it. They were my great. kryptonite. So... <laughs> Leading up to this, we were living together and in this apartment and I had been off the rails, uh, per se. And we went to, we were invited out to one of the uh, couple's like okay. poolside apartments. They had access from the pool. So like we go there, there's a bunch of other people and we're making mojitos and drinking all night long. And I remember we had, Erica looks at me at some point and says, we have a dinner reservation tonight stop drinking and i'm like no problem and then i remember waking up the sun was gleaming on me it's not the sun was gleaming on me i was in our backyard i was naked in a beach chair i had a i believe a sunflower pot on my lap cracked with dirt all over me Butt naked. Butt naked. And the whole building could see. And I just remember like looking up and opening my eyes and the whole building's balconies were all above me. And I was like, oh no. I was like, oh, what did I do? I'm like, I wonder if we made dinner, you know? So like I knocked on the door. And this was just like another day in the life. Yeah, like, this, this was, was like yeah, a very like, common occurrence. I was like knocking on the back door and I just remember her coming out to the back door and being like, and like maybe giving me the finger or something like that. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, what did I do? But I do remember that being like a really big tipping point where I was like, okay, my whole building saw me naked, but also with a flower pot and dirt all over me. I don't even know what I did at the pool. I probably need to get a hold of this. Yeah. Um, and we were engaged too. We were engaged. That so was like another issue. He, yeah. So like he proposed to me in the midst of like, like a, a few week sober stint, supposedly. I mean, like, like I could reel it in. I could I could pull it together for, yeah, like for some, weeks at yeah, a time yeah. and just get it done and still go to work every day. Uh, um, you know, not performing at my best, but like go to work every day, be a, a functioning member. And then there was just days like I couldn't, like it was a full-time really job yeah. to make sure you wake up every day and not be sick. And mm -hmm. that was the saddest part. Like it was a full-time job. You needed a lot of money to support your full-time job. Um, and it was a lot of work. And if you didn't do what you had to do, you'd be like really sick, mm -hmm. really, really sick. And um, surprisingly, opiates are the one drug that if you don't take and you withdraw you feel like you're gonna die but yet you won't 
Um, like Xanax or like alcohol, you actually can die. Yes, like you actually can die drugs, from Xanax and alcohol. You well. But you won't feel as bad as withdrawing from opiates. Opiates literally, you think your world is over and your bones hurt, your 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 life just is spinning out of control. So to avoid that, you need to continue your habit every day. Um, so we were engaged and I would pull it together for a couple of weeks and then I'd lose it. And then she was just like, I had enough. And I was like, all right, I know this one other space, this one other place. And I, I knew about this place um, because our family friend um, who runs this, this, this place called um, LICAD on Long Island, Long Island for Center, Long Island Center tell, for, they're a great uh, space to reach out to. Long Island. Center for Addiction and Recovery, right? No. Or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. I'll uh, I'll have to look it up. It's sad that I don't know that, but um, I do a lot of work with them and I help a lot of people because they helped me. So I reached out to my friend, Steve Chasman, and he reached out to this place called Karen. And Karen accepted me. Um, it was very expensive, but the level of care that I received was incredible. I went for 45 days and it changed my life. They saved my life basically. Yeah. Um, you also did, you were ready for it. Because I was ready. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Like yeah. that's such a cliche statement, but it's so, it's very true. It rings true time and time again, sick and tired of being sick and tired. Um, and waking up and feeling like death. So. And just having to keep up with your triple lives that you were living. I told my whole family, I told her family, I said, I need to go do this. I told everyone at work, I'm going to do this. Whatever happens, happens. I know that I'm, I, I just need to go do this. So packed my bags, went there. She was not happy with me. Yeah, at this time I was basically like she was mentally like done. done. Like I was really done at this point. My mother, like truly done. my father, my sister, all disappointed in me. Her family disappointed in me. My friends, we were all on different paths because we were all deep in this game and just a mess. So um, yeah, I went. I went for 45 days. It changed my life completely. Complete 180. I met my best friend, who is now my best friend, um, in that treatment center. Um, Karen in Pennsylvania, Reading, Pennsylvania. And I came out. And I started doing the work. Um, you went to meetings, 90 meetings in 90 days. I did a, I did a lot of Step AA work. and NA meetings, step work, um, trying to get to the root of, of why you try and make, your feel, make yourself feel numb all the time. Um, so that was tough work. Um, but I did it. And uh, I'm six years sober today. It's amazing. By the grace of God Every day, and my wife like, and wow. my family. It's, it's incredible. It's very crazy. Um, my best friend from Karen is also sober. And, and now we're like best friends for life. It's wild how it brought us together. It's, yeah, it's yeah. very crazy. And, so and I've stayed sober through some really, really, really hard and dark times. The hardest. You yeah, the hardest. Um, but yeah, it saved my life. And I owe it all to Karen. So I'd say since I've gotten out, I've helped many, many, many people into all types of programs, um, a lot going into Karen because I feel indebted to them because they, they really did help save my life and turn my life around. So that's my story about, um, you know, the How depths of, the, the, yeah, the yeah. depths of depression and addiction and, and coming out on top. And I don't drink and I don't do drugs anymore. I don't smoke pot. Nothing. It's just, it's just not, you know, today I feel great, so why mess it up? I just and, keep it rolling one day yeah. at a time. And that's really what Vin, Vinny focused on. Like, mm -hmm. when he came out, he, people would be like, but are you ever going to go to, like, wine country and enjoy, like, a glass of wine? And you're never going to have this again. You're never going to have that again. And he's like, well, for today, I'm not drinking because I'm choosing my sobriety. And it's, like, never – it's really being so mindful and present. And you truly practice that. 
but even beyond your sobriety, and I think that's what makes you so special, when you're with people, you are always so present and you just give everyone your all when you're with them. And I think that's a treat you have that helps you in your sobriety too. Just being in the here and now where your feet are and living in that moment. And it's admirable how you're like that. And I have to say, like, when he was away at rehab, um, like I said before, I was really, I felt like I was completely done. I just couldn't take it anymore. How much of this can I go through? But after he came home, it was a lot of like, okay, like what does Vinny need? And he's very structured and we have to like follow the structure to support him. And eventually that kind of led me to discover my spirituality because he was, you know, tapping into sobriety and I started to open up spiritually after going plant-based. And he often says like, oh, I think you stopped drinking because, and I want to clarify something about that in a few moments, but he'd be like, I think you stopped drinking because like I'm sober now. And it was weird because I didn't feel that way. I wasn't like, I'm not going to drink anymore because of you. But how our how our journeys lined up, it was so like synergistic, I guess. Like the spiritual, like you came home in November and then that next winter, I started to tap into spirituality and I started to practice Kundalini. And then after practicing Kundalini, I didn't feel that need to self-medicate anymore with alcohol. And I think I recognize so much in myself, not that I, I mean, maybe I had an addiction, but like not yeah. obviously not like you, like I self-medicated a lot with alcohol, but I noticed that in myself because of you, like I see how present you were, how calm you were, how you had no anxiety. And I'd be sitting on the couch on a Sunday next to you and you'd be like happy, laughing, watching the TV present. And I would be thinking about like all of the things that could be wrong with me or like wrong with the future. That's absolutely true. I yeah. mean, I would say that I'd really chalk it up to the fact that you were not really around drinking as much as I stopped drinking. Therefore, you stop drinking as much. And then slowly over time, you were just like, well, if you're not going to have a drink, then I don't need a drink. And then slowly that evolved to, I don't need a drink. I feel better when I'm not drinking. Evolved more to, I actually feel way better now that I'm not drinking than when I did drink. Why do I want to be hungover yeah. for that like small, you know, couple hour window where I'm drunk? And then I have to be hung over for the next day and we're getting older and it's harder and harder to come back from that two day, you know, hangover. So I think it just evolved to not being around it as much. And if you're not around it as much, then you do it less. And that's just a fact. I completely agree. But I had this like aha moment with alcohol. Like I, as I said before, I definitely self-medicated. And I remember one night, I think you were playing volleyball in the summer and I was cooking dinner. I always drank a lot when I cooked because I never liked cooking and it just like made it more fun for me. And I remember I cooked dinner, I ate dinner all without having a glass of wine. And I was like, wait a minute, why aren't I drinking? And then I was like, I have to, that's what I do every night. So I got my bottle of wine, poured myself a glass and then took a sip and was like, wait a minute, I don't even want this. And I started to like put the pieces together that like practicing Kundalini calmed my nervous system. So I didn't need to take that edge off that I was always seeking. But it's funny how it literally aligned with like your sobriety too. And I do agree. Like, I think as a couple, we may have just entered a different frequency together because you were no longer on right. drugs. We were no longer in that like addiction frequency. And maybe that even helped me. I know that you helped me in so many ways to elevate um, and also living in Long Beach, we always say, like just helped with his sobriety, my spiritual awakening without living by the ocean. We always wonder if we would be where we are right I now. I mean, I agree with that statement completely, um, yeah. you know, but there is another viewpoint to look at living in Long Beach is really tough because it's, it is yeah. a bar town yeah. and everyone's drinking every night, beach parties, bar parties, house parties, all throughout the summer, it's just like walk down the street and there's another party going on. Feel free, walk in, walk out. So it is hard in that sense to, I guess, combat really the, the want um, or feeling like you need to drink with everyone. But with practice, um, with a lot of practice, I, I was able to overcome that. And I would definitely um, say that the meetings 
in Long Beach um, were incredible and helped me a lot because the people in Long Beach living um, living in the area and going to those meetings um, in that church basement helped me immensely. Yeah. Being able to call any of those kids, um, grown men, women, you know, younger than me. It's it, There was a complete range of, of people all... Walks of life. All walks of life, all trying to um, get to that same all working towards that same goal of just being able to wake up every day and be grateful for each and every day, not having to drink or, or drug. And yeah. um, that community down there is amazing, helped me immensely. And I've actually uh, been able to help a ton of other people um, get to those meetings and those meetings have helped save their lives as well. So yeah. what would you say to someone <clears throat> who's going through addiction right now? Like regardless of what kind of, addic- of addiction, what would you say to them? There's really only one thing to say to them, and I would I would probably say um, you're only going to stop if you want it bad enough. There's nobody in the world can make your family, your mother, your your child. There's no one that can make you want to get help or make you want to to get healthy or get better again yeah it's impossible Mm -hmm. you have to want it so bad so deep in your heart you have to want to get better so badly that you are willing to do anything necessary and listen to the people that are sober and and willing to help you um you have to want it so badly that you're willing to listen to them and take suggestions and do what they say. Mm -hmm. Whether it be going off to rehab for a year or 30 days or an inpatient program, an outpatient program, um, medication, whatever that path is for you, nobody else can force that upon you. You literally have to want it so bad that you're willing to do anything to get sober. Because without that will, without that pain inside Mm -hmm. your heart, you're always going to go back to to take the easy way take the easy way out and and that's just to continue to drink or drug yeah to fill that void let me ask you a question though because being the person that was with someone with an addiction i always wanted to like help you i always wanted to get through yeah. to you do you think like i know that no one can make you do it just like you said it all has to boil down to you but do you think like since me and your parents made your life more uncomfortable do you think that helped you to get to that like do you think there's anything that helps you to get to that point or is it really just like you need to hit rock bottom yourself or like your fiance saying like i'm literally leaving does that help your family saying like you might not have a job you might not be welcome to our family events does that help you get to that point or is it really something internally i think it's a culmination of a lot of things but if you look at history and just look at i'm sure you can think of many um, examples of this but <clears throat> how do you think people wind out wind up out on the streets yeah because their family has told them that they have to go. Yeah. Their wives have told have told them they they're out of the house. Their girlfriends, mm-hmm. their significant others gotta go. And you know what they choose? They choose drugs yeah. over over sobriety, not because they they want to, but because yeah. that's the easy way out in the present moment. Right. It's a lot harder to put in the work. Yeah. To go away to rehab, to to admit defeat, it's a lot harder to do all of those things than it is to, um, to just say that you're, you're done and and, and you need help. Yeah. So, I would say that the perfect example is that um, right. it's way harder to admit defeat than it is to um, continue using. Yeah. I know someone very close to us right now is going through recovery, like the the beginning days of recovery. And what they're sharing with us is that, wow, I'm actually like feeling again. Like I have to deal with emotions that I haven't felt in years. And 
it's hard to navigate because now you don't have those substances to help numb you. Right. Like you have to look that shit in the eyes and face it. So do you remember that time in your life? Do you ever, did you feel like after rehab, like, oh my God, I'm like feeling different things. Like, what were you feeling? I honestly remember post rehab being really weird. Like I felt like, <laughs> I don't know. I felt like there was like weirdness between us. Like I was so happy you were home, but it was like, you, you were a completely different person. And I just remember like when you were on drugs, like I would know because your face would immediately, it was like the life was taken out of your soul. Like your face, like you wouldn't smile in the way you would. Your eyeballs look different. Just your numb. whole face looked different. And then when you were sober, like it was like that spirit and that energy was within you that I loved so much. So like, tell me like after rehab, was it as weird for you as it was for me? Like. I just thought it was kind of weird. Um, I think, <laughs> no, it, it definitely was weird. It was just like from being so not present for so long and just like lying and just being, trying to, to juggle all of these lives. Like you're living so many different lives that yeah. it's like hard to just be present and, and be happy. Mm -hmm. So it was really tough to, to, to be who I really was yeah. when I was numbing myself every day. So after rehab, it's like, okay, well, I'm sober now. Like now what? You know what I mean? Like um, waking up, it's a different routine. Yeah. Getting dressed, going to work, talking to people, talking to customers, talking to your wife. It's kind of like a breakup because you don't it's, have the same rituals that you did. That it's you have, like, starting over. Yeah. It's literally like being an infant and learning how to walk, read, talk, doing all that stuff again because you literally have to, to reteach yourself, especially after being an addict for so long. Yeah. Six, seven, eight, ten years, however long you're you're in that game for. Like, Imagine like being like, all right, hold on, start this new life. Here you go. After 30, 45 days, like I, I did. Right. Here after 45 days, kick you right in the ass and, and send you back into the, the yeah. environment that you just came from. Right. Like And it's also sad. An embarrassment remember. too. Yeah. And being embarrassed is like a, another thing. Like going back to my apartment and seeing all those people again. It's like, oh, yeah, I was, I'm the sunflower guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like living with those it was weird yeah. you had to like we had to build a relationship again right once i got yeah. clean and, and sober. there was so much of a lack of trust like when i tell you it was literally like there was another person in our relationship because that was the other person right that the the drugs like the sneaking around to go and pick up the drugs or pay for the drugs or whatever whatever it was yeah that's so true what do you think this is the last question i want to ask you what do you think is like key to overcoming addiction like what really when you got home and you're oh that's what i want to say i remember your dad telling me how it actually will take up to a year for your brain to go back to normal Rewire after itself. after the drugs you were taking taking so what ritual, what did you add? I think I know the answer, but I want I want to see what you say. Like, what really saved your life post rehab? What did you implement in your daily routine that kept you focused, kept you just excited for life? Because I know like drugs, I it makes you like excited. Like there's a reason why you take them because you it makes you feel good in that moment. Yeah, it's fire rushing and your brain. You need to be able to self-generate that. And that's why I love Kundalini because it gives you that like Fair excitement. Enough. Like you it. wake up and 100%. you're like, yes, I'm gonna feel effing great today. So like what was it that really helped you post rehab? I don't know. Now, now you have me thinking like, am I gonna say the wrong thing? There's no wrong thing. I know, but you but you're I, like, oh I know. So I think okay. I know. I would, say, say the wrong thing. It's I would say I would say post this is just what comes to mind. I listen, I grew up going to the gym. Yeah. Going to the that's gym. What I was gonna say. Going to the gym <laughs> yeah. every day, or at least being some sort of athlete or doing some sp sort of sport. Um, but definitely being in the gym and working out to relieve whatever stress. I remember coming home from the gym and taking a picture in the mirror. Yep. This is exactly what I was going to Multiple say. Multiple <laughs> pictures in the mirror and being like, oh my God. And just being like, I do not 
want to look like this anymore. This is not who I am. This is like, I'm a shell of myself. And from that day on, yeah. I've never taken a break from the gym, meaning, oh, I took uh, three months off. Oh, I took a year off. Oh, I used to work out. From that day on six years ago, mm-hmm. I have constantly been in the gym. And if I'm not in the gym, I play hockey. It's because, yeah, exactly. I play hockey three days a or week. Or like you're fishing. I'm fishing yeah. three days a week. I'm playing golf a lot. Um, yeah. But some sort of physical activity every single week, mm-hmm. um, most days really, Yeah. definitely helped me feel alive again. Definitely. And I, I have pictures like from that day one all the way until now. Like if I really went back, I could literally, you can see like week one, I had pictures, week two, three, five, six, And he wrote down every single thing that he ate. Like he could look in his phone right now and tell you what he ate on August 15, 2017 or 18, whatever it was. But they also say that like, that's the addiction. (laughs) Well, that's like the obsessive compulsive part of addiction. I'm a Virgo. Um, I know a lot of other friends that I have that are very similar that were also addicts also have these compulsions like um you know I stopped doing drugs and drinking but I started going to the gym every day and I, I wrote down every single workout for right. six years and every single thing I ate for six years so yeah. I, I know my body in inside and out um and they're like oh well I do that with you know spending money right. or shopping or right. you do um, that for a while too I mean, I still do it, but yeah. uh, I, I chalk that up to... I was being kind to saying you did it for a while. I definitely have a, a shopping <laughs> a, addiction. Um, uh, I think I get that from my mother. Yeah. My we mom. Love yeah. I mean, definitely from my mother. She was definitely addicted to the max. She was a best um, gift giver. But also to take into consideration is your gene, like your, your yeah. history, uh, your family history, because I know I can track down addiction in my family yeah. right there. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's very present, and that's usually nine times out of ten. Yeah. If you you can look back in your family and say, "Oh well, my cousin is addicted to so and so, or an alcoholic." Oh look, his mom or his dad, and and you could trace it back. And and I would say like eight out of ten families these days all have it running through. Everyone their family. knows someone. Everyone knows someone. Everyone knows someone. And I remember when you were going away, my mom was so concerned. It was like, don't tell people at work that like your fiance's away at rehab. And I'm like, mom, this is the <laughs> new earth. Like people are accepting and understanding. Like, you know, she was just worried about me and Vinny and everything and just thought there was like still that stigma because in the past there was. But Absolutely. like now in this new age, like where we just have a lot more compassion, understanding and knowing like everyone knows someone. And I've really learned that in this journey too. Yeah, but I was going to say movement for you too. Yeah. Movement's medicine. And he does stay very busy. I do wonder sometimes exactly what you said. Like, is that still an addiction present within you? Or is that mm. just taking that maybe people who are addicts have this like extra energy within them and it just needs to be channeled into a healthier space, you know? And that's what you're choosing to do now to the point sometimes I'm like, just slow down. God. Like, can you just slow down to, and be home and chill? I know. That, like, that's that is like, a, that's a one, thing I That's like our one on. struggle. <laughs> My one struggle is that I, I tend to work all day and then I come home and I'm like, all right, well, I have a hockey game till 11 p.m. Or like, like you want to work out or... And it's all good because like, yeah. you know, we're both so busy, which is in a good, in a good, healthy, productive way. But you do. You just go and go and go. Yeah, I do. I do which go. is good. But... Thank you. Thank you for sharing all that you shared. We have a lot more to cover in our next episode. We're going to go a little bit deeper into when I first started practicing Kundalini, going vegan. I remember that day so vividly. How that was for you. Just a quick teaser. We're going to talk about the next episode. I mean, I remember (laughs) it like it was yesterday, the first day she told me about Kundalini. So you have to come back. Just come on back because (laughs) you're going to want to hear this one. Yes. Thank you for being here. You got I it. couldn't do anything, love any you. of this without you. I love you. Love you. Thank you guys for being here Thanks. and listening. If you have any questions, if you know anyone going through recovery or Reach struggling out. with addiction, Vinny really loves to extend any help. Hit me um, up on Instagram. I yeah. will answer and I hopefully connect will you get to the you right help. people. So if you 100% know anyone, get you help. 
Thank you guys. Thank you for Thank listening. You. May the long time sun shine upon you. Satnam. <laughs>